much. So uh, let's see uh, how we do in this uh, coming hour. So uh, I was thinking about it a little bit and I uh, thought that I would still spend maybe 15 minutes on the uh, XXX model to tell you a few more important uh, uh, things about it before I go on to the algebraic beta ansatz. And then if I use 15 minutes in the fourth hour to complete the algebraic beta ansatz before I move on to applications, then uh, so be it. Um, so, uh, I just wanted to ask you first if you have questions about the last session of this morning where we rushed through essentially the coordinate beta ansatz for the XXX model. Is the yes. You said one curious one thing that was curious to me. You, you, you said that XXX is physically more important. I yes. That. Then, then why is it that I was a little bit out of puzzle that most of the people in the integrability on their integrability community seem to be studying XXZ? Yes. So the uh, natural realization of, uh, if you want, coupled uh, magnetic degrees of freedom is such that the overlapping electronic integrals lead directly to a spin isotropic exchange. The thing that can happen, of course, is that, so, so, so typically in a crystal, uh, you know, more often than not, most of the examples I'll show you, actually, the residual spin half that you have comes from uh, a copper atom. And then, of course, the exchange between these spin half uh, uh, degrees of freedom can be either directly overlapping electronic integrals, or more often than not, mediated via different atoms. So it's much more natural to have this direct uh, uh, exchange leading to an S dot S term. Um, so in order to get some anisotropy built in there, you need to require some complicated overlapping electronic states. So for example, uh, I'll show you a realization of an XXZ model, which to a first degree of approximation, has exactly, by construction, delta is one half. Uh, and you know, uh, you'll remember that this is also a particularly interesting point uh, for the XXZ state classification and everything. Um, but uh, to uh, have, for example, a tunable delta, this is not possible in solid state magnetic systems. It is, however, possible now in the context of cold atoms. So there are some experimental groups uh, most importantly that of Immanuel Bloch, uh, who are able to essentially simulate quantum magnets like this. And then the, the, the statement that I always get from Immanuel is that he can realize XXX with delta modulable within, say, 20% of the value delta is equal to 1. And then they can, they can do some things. But in nature, it's impossible to tune delta, and it's very rare to find a crystal that has a delta which is or you know, to find a clean realization of a one-dimensional system with a delta that takes a value different than one. Very often you'll have maybe effective exchanges in there that lead you to a delta which is different, but then you have, you have loads of other junk in there. But maybe in the fourth installment, I'll just show you specific crystals, and then you'll see they're all XXX except for one of them. No, that's very interesting, but it's only on the first half. Yeah so, why, yeah, so 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 theoretically, of course, one of the great advantages of uh, uh, doing the anisotropic case is that at least it gives you a touch to the Ising limit. The advantage of the Ising limit is that the state classification is completely unambiguous. And if you follow the argumentation, for example, by Michel Godin in his thesis and also in his book, uh, essentially, throughout the region where delta is greater than 1, so from infinity, easing point, down to delta is 1, you don't expect a breakdown of the state classification. Therefore, to each eigenstate of xxz with delta greater than or equal to 1, you can point, if you want, to an easing state that, uh, that is a kind of uh, continuously linked to it, or a, combination, a simple combination of easing states. The problem is that when you reach delta is 1, of course, uh, many things happen. So, of course, delta is 1 is characterized by a global SU2 symmetry. And uh, this is one of the little messages I wanted to, to give you. So, the, the delta is 1 point. You have to be a little bit careful when you talk about a complete basis of states because the beta ansatz. Uh, formally, if you close your eyes and only look at solutions of beta equations in terms of finite rapidities, it only gives you highest weight states of this global SU2. Okay? So, of course, the, uh, 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 
the, the thing here is that you get loads of uh, degenerate states at delta is 1 uh, that then get you know, split up by the uh, value of delta which goes away from 1. And then if you cross into the gapless regime, so if your delta becomes less than 1, the state classification becomes an utter mess. Because unlike for delta greater than 1, not all string lengths are allowed, or not all string lengths are associated to well-defined uh, excitations in your beta states. So I think the reason why XXZ is, uh, is so much studied, certainly in the gapped regime, is first of all that the state classification is completely unambiguous, but also the presence of a gap makes many calculations very well, you know, uh, ordered, if you want. So like uh, when you do a sign Gordon field theory, you want to calculate some physical amplitudes and things, then summing over just uh, the numerable set of excitations completely saturates your, your sum rolls and things. And the same holds true, of course, for uh, XXZ and the gapped regime. But in the gapless regime, uh, there are many, many very interesting uh, uh, questions about how you have to interpret the resummations in there. So, so I think, uh, so I mean, it's part of a different course, a more advanced course, maybe on understanding all these results from beta ansatz in the field theory language. Then it's, so, so all this is easy on the gapped side, but in the gapless regime, it becomes much, uh, much less easy. So, uh, uh, and of course, you know, we're theorists, so if we have a parameter that we can play with, then it's great. So, <laughs> yeah. Okay, other questions? Uh, Okay, so uh, let me just uh, go very, very quickly uh, through this. So we had uh, not even written down the beta equations for, uh, for XXX. I had shown them to you on the, uh, on the slides, but you have them in the notes in equation uh, 8.3, 8 .8 right? So, uh, so the beta equations themselves, they take the form of algebraic equations. So for example, if you have... Uh, things like this, to the power n is equal to the product of b different than a, lambda a minus lambda b plus i over lambda a minus lambda b minus i. Okay, so just a, a couple of comments here. So I've, uh, I've already kind of told you about the existence of complex solutions to, to these equations that I will let you explore at the hand of the notes and uh, by yourselves a little bit. You can just ask yourselves if you put a certain number of downspins, which typically in the spin chains I call M. So M is the number of downturn spins as compared to the fully ferromagnetic background. Um, if you take uh, M finite as you take M to infinity, you see immediately that these string structures are uh, possible. So namely, if for example, lambda a has a positive imaginary part, then as you take the limit n going to infinity, the left-hand side blows up. And in order for these equations to be fulfilled, there has to exist a lambda b such that the, the numerator on the right-hand side becomes zero. Okay, so that just shows you that the string structures are stabilized here. Whereas in Bose gas, this was not the case. Okay, another observation that you can make here is that if you were to, by hand, take one of your rapidities to infinity, then you would simply degenerate to a set of beta equations for a state that has one less downspin. Okay, so let me, for example, take lambda 1 and go to plus infinity. Then essentially what I get is that the, the set, so, so, so this set here is for a state with m downspins, but if I take, say, the, uh, the last of these rapidities and I send it to infinity, I just fall onto a set of equations, which is a set of big equations for a state with n minus 1 downspin. Okay, so this relates to the comment I just uh, made about the global SU2. Essentially, at the xxx point, there is a principle of classification of states, which goes as follows. If you, uh, uh, if you have a, uh, a state with only finite rapidities, then the state is the highest weight state of the global SU2. Okay, again, the proof of this is just a simple algebraic manipulation at the hand of the coordinate beta ansatz wave function. So that's one of the useful things you can do with the uh, xxx beta wave function. You can show that it's a highest weight state explicitly by direct manipulation. So again, this is done in... Uh, uh, 
uh, well, for example, in Gaudin's book. Um, now, what you have, of course, is that you can do this many, many times. So the eigenstates of the XXX chain, of course, they live in the tensor product space of you know, n spin halves. So you can classify all these uh, states into the global SU2. Okay? So essentially then the, uh, uh, the, the total spin of the state can go from anything from 0 to n over 2. Okay? So of course if you have total spin n over 2, then you have twice that plus 1 states in this multiplet. And these, within these global SU2 multiplets, you go from one state to the other by the global spin raising or lowering operator which is the zero momentum spin raising or lowering, which is the infinite lambda particle, if you want. Okay, so a, a lambda at infinity is represented by the global spin lowering operator. Now I'm a little confused because you said, I mean, I, I thought that the, the fact that one only finds a hyper state and that's a feature of the algebraic data. What is the data as far as I remember you actually find all the states if you are careful? So if you are at yeah so so let's uh, let's make the following st statement at x x x at, at x x z with delta different than one, then the uh, the states that you obtain from the straight beta ansatz form you know as far as we know we have no reason to disbelieve that a complete set of states. Mm -hmm. If you write the x x x coordinate beta ansatz wave function, you can show by direct manipulation that it is a highest weight state of the global SU2. So the coordinate beta ansatz wave function itself, its structure, its spin structure, is such that it's a highest weight state. So you directly apply S raising uh, uniformly, so the global S raising operator, onto the wave function and you do the spin commutation relations and you find zero. Right? So the, the thing is that there's nothing wrong because in a sense what happens at XXX is that you can put rapidities at infinity if you so wish. It's still a solution to the beta equation. When you crank delta away from 1, these rapidities at infinity, they will start going up on a complex imaginary line or coming back on the real axis, depending on what you do with delta. Yeah, but what I'm I mean, as you will surely discuss, I mean, these, uh, high, I mean the extra states somehow related to beta roots at infinity in, in, the, in, the, in the algebraic language. But then in this corner, I think you just find the indeed the momentum to be something like pi. So yeah, so if you put if you put the so so remember in the spin chain there's there's an equation in your note that says k is equal to pi minus two arctan lambda. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if you put lambda to infinity, mm -hmm. the, the physical momentum associated to the, the, the spin wave, if you want, is zero. Okay, so it shows you so essentially when you add a magnum at zero momentum. The only thing that you're doing is that you are lowering the global uh, SZ component of uh, the SZ component of the global SU2. Okay, so so uh, so you know to uh, uh, to obtain a complete set of states, you just have to do that. So you just have to take all the states that you obtain as solutions of beta ansatz equations with finite rapidities, and then for each of those, you know which uh, uh, total spin they live in because this is just given to you by the number of downspins that, that, that you have, so n over 2 minus that. And then to each of these states, you can add a certain number of infinite rapidities formally. And this will give you a complete set of states. Okay? Away from the xxx point, you don't need to do that explicitly because they are, from the very beginning, represented by different solutions to the beta equations. Yeah? So the in the XXZ case, essentially, these states that would degenerate into the SU2 uh, multiplet as delta S1, they are split. So all the rapidities shift a little bit, so then you can easily distinguish them. Right? But the, the, the important point is that uh, if you want, uh, uh, this is really a feature of the solutions of the beta equations. And the beta equations are the same whether you're doing coordinate or algebraic. It's the same you know, set of... Uh, Algebraic conditions on the on the rapidities, and you know, it's, uh, they still give you the labeling for the states in this way. Yeah, you can discuss it more later if needed. Okay, so um, uh, let's see. So 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 that was the comment about uh, the um, uh, 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 the 
global SU2. Um, we had uh, written also, or I had shown you the, um, uh, the logarithmic form of the beta equations that we always use uh, to actually solve the, the beta equations themselves because we can easily classify the, uh, the states. So log form. Okay, so then we have uh, theta 1 of lambda A minus 1 over N summation over all B. Theta 2 lambda A minus B is equal to 2 pi over N times some, some integer by A. Or, yeah, so the parity of this integer again depends on the magnetization you have, but uh, it's, just, uh, it's just a quantum number that you have. Now, one, um, one marked difference between the beta equations for the linear and for the spin chain here, I should tell you what these thetas are, right? So these thetas are just our scattering kernel, kernels. So theta n of lambda is equal to 2 arctan of uh, lambda times 2 divided by n. Okay, so the marked difference between the spin chain and the uh, uh, the linear gas, as far as the log beta, beta equations are concerned, is that, of course, in here, we have a bounded domain of available quantum numbers. So say that I give you the restriction that the rapidities have to be real, then, unlike in the most gas case, the left-hand side is bounded. Okay? So in the spin chain case, the available quantum numbers sit within an interval. You cannot have quantum numbers beyond a certain limit. Okay? And these limits are computed for you for very many different cases in uh, section 8.2.2. You know, states with only real rapidities. Okay? And then you find actually that the situation is a little bit strange because if you look at the special case of zero magnetization, there is only one eigenstate with real finite rapidities. All other states have either rapidities at infinity or complex rapidities. Okay? It's a very special feature of the zero magnetization case. So in the zero magnetization case, the ground state is the unique state which has no bound magnons whatsoever. It's the only one. And the nice thing is that essentially the distribution of roots then extends to infinity. So unlike the Lieb equation, so the equation determining the uh, uh, ground state of the Lieb-Linegar model, the equivalent of that for the spin chain, when you take the continuum limit, the distributions extend up to infinity, which means that you can use convolution theorem, you can just solve the equation for the ground state using Fourier transforms. Okay, so that's a case which is uh, solved exactly. Let me just refer to you um, to uh, section 9.2 in the notes, because it's done in there. I mean, I'm really going to let you look at that in view of the time. In chapter 9, you have the thermodynamic limit of the spin chain, which goes precisely along the lines of the thermodynamic limit for the linear. But, as a first nice little case, in section 9.2, when you write down the equation for the distribution of roots in the ground state, in the absence of a magnetic field, so at zero magnetization, then you can solve it explicitly, and then you get a distribution which is equation 9.15. Okay, it's just one over cosh pi lambda that gives to you the exact ground state. So this is a nice thing because it's the first analytic solution that we have for uh, a beta state. It allows to calculate in particular the ground state energy of the Heisenberg chain, and then you get this log 2 which was first derived in 1938 by Wurden, okay, one of the uh, seven years after Peter's paper. This one guy uh, computed the ground state energy exactly, and then there was a period of uh, you know, uh, almost 20 years before uh, Orbach uh, started the ball again by looking at XAC. Okay? So, uh, so this calculation is uh, is done in uh, in the notes here. You can very easily see it. Okay, so. Uh, so maybe I can just very briefly uh, mention that. So specific case where the number of downspins is equal to m over 2. So that's zero magnetization.
you get an exact ground state rho of lambda in the thermodynamic limit, rho of lambda is then just 1 over, uh, one, over <coughs> 1 over 2, uh, 1 over 2, that's right, 2 to the cosh pi lambda, okay? And that gives you that uh, uh, E is equal to just some uh, minus n log 2 blah, 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 plus uh, order of one corrections. Okay? Um, so this is root 10, 1938. The nice thing is that the analytical solution of states extends also to the low energy spectrum. In the notes, in section 9.3, I now construct excitations similarly to what we did for the case of the Bose gas by taking my ground state, but now what I do, the most simple case is to say, turn one of the downspins back up. So now I have zero magnetization, but then plus one. So essentially my number of downspins is n over 2 minus 1. Okay? I had n over 2 slots for n over 2 rapidities for the ground state. Now I move to the state with magnetization 1. I have n over 2 minus 1 downspins. But now I have n over 2 plus 1 available slots in there. Okay? So really what that means is that I have position, I, I can label my states by the positions of the two holes. Okay? And these states are then called the, the two spin-on states. Okay, so this is done for you in equation 9.3. Okay, and again, maybe, maybe for tomorrow you can look a little bit uh, at that. So, so, so let's, let's do it like this. Let me just illustrate this. So the ground state. Okay, let me illustrate it like this. Okay, these are my quantum numbers. This is zero, and here is a boundary that I like calling I uh, infinity. So any rapidity that would have a quantum number equal to or greater than this would be strictly at infinity or beyond. So the ground state is the only state with finite rapidities, which are real. That's the ground state. Now, I can construct, so, so here m is equal to n over 2, zero magnetization, so I have a 12 side chain, 6 downspins. Now what I can construct are excitations that are, that are known as the two spin-ons, excitations, where essentially what I do is that I do m is equal to n over 2 minus 1, so magnetization is 1, and now what happens is that the new boundary is one half step further, Okay. I have space for my five rapidities. And there are two available holes. So now I can move these around. So I can construct many states. So for example, I could construct this state here. Okay. And the states within this class are characterized by the positions of these two holes here. Okay, so the low-lying excitations around the ground state of a Heisenberg antiferromagnet at zero magnetic field are labeled by these zeros here, by these empty quantum numbers. And they obey semionic statistics in the sense that you add one and then you get space for another one, just like all they described. And uh, these essentially are the physically important excitations, even for the, uh, uh, for the correlations that I'll show you later. So the nice thing is that you can calculate the dispersion relation you can obtain analytically. And what you find is that the dispersion relation of one of these spin-ons, as a function of the momentum p, it's just some renormalized, sorry, this is J. Okay, so just the absolute value of this. So it's a sinusoidal 
you'll see plots that I'll show you tomorrow. So if you have momentum and energy here, the two spin on continuum looks like this, you know, I call it the Viking helmet. Uh, it's appropriate for Stockholm. Okay? So it looks like a continuum like this. So a couple of uh, just uh, physical comments about this. This is very, very different to what you generically, generically expect in uh, a weakly interacting quantum system, for example, a Fermi, a Fermi gas. A Fermi gas has well-defined single particle excitations. There's no such thing as a single particle excitation in a quantum magnet. They always come in multiples, at least two in this case. There's always a scattering continuum, so you always get these broad lines instead of these well-defined single coherent modes. It's very characteristic of these uh, Heisenberg mag magnets. <coughs> it's, it's in fact one of the experimental signals that was uh, looked after at the beginnings and which is now very, very clearly seen in, uh, in experiments, as I'll show you tomorrow. Okay, so, uh, so uh, again, I, I invite you to look at the notes to understand these uh, these peculiarities of XXX and how you calculate these dispersion relations in zero field, if you crank up the magnetic field to any finite value, you cannot close the equations analytically anymore. Then you can still do numerics to find the thermodynamic distributions to great accuracy and compute the, uh, the excitation spectrum and dispersions around that, but at zero field you can do it analytically. Okay? So of course this is uh, this is working provided you don't pump in a thermodynamically large number of spin-ons in your state. So, so you might know that the, uh, uh, the XXZ in the GAT regime uh, has also been described using so-called vertex operator approach at uh, Jimbo Miwa and uh, things. I mean, are, are some of you maybe uh, studying that or looking at that? UQSL2 hat representation theory, you get states and matrix elements and things. So this is, uh, also in there. So essentially, the, 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 the basis of states that's used in Jimbo Miwa is the spin on basis here. And it's valid for a number of spin ons, which is non entropic and non, non thermodynamically large. So for a zero density of spin ons. But okay, maybe uh, I'll just leave these private discussions. Okay? So uh, once again, in the notes, you'll be able to complement what, uh, what I've told here about the states. Um, in chapter 10 of the notes, which I'm also not going to show you uh, now in view of the time, you have a very quick summary of the finite temperature equilibrium thermodynamics of the model. It's very similar to what happens in the Lieb Linegar case, except of course that now you have to introduce distributions for all types of particles at the same time. So you have a density for the one strings, so for the single magnons, you also have a densities for the two strings, three strings, etc. And these all get populated thermally when, uh, uh, you, know, when you put the, the temperature in there. So anyway, the, the equations are in there and the same logic applies. You can write an effective Gibbs free energy functional in there. You can evaluate this in a saddle point and you get a description for the thermal steady state. Uh, not the steady state, but the uh, equilibrium state that you, uh, that you get the saddle point state of the thermal equilibrium. But, uh, you know, I'll let you delve through that uh, in your own time. Uh, okay? So, you know, again, uh, bulldozing my way through uh, XXX and things. Are there questions at this stage? Now I would like to move on to the algebraic data sets. Any other questions? Okay. So let's now uh, just uh, close this discussion about specific models and uh, coordinate wave functions. Let us try to maybe uh, adopt a completely different way of thinking about integrable models. So uh, remember that quite a few of you had uh, studied the, the algebraic beta ansatz. Let me just present to you a kind of uh, way of thinking about the algebraic beta ansatz, which might be you know, relatively close to the way they originally came up with it, but it's, it's the way I like uh, thinking about it. So, um, first of all, uh, what we'd like to do is, uh, of course, classify all uh, integrable models that we have in quantum theory. It's a very complicated problem, so we need to organize this, uh, this search in a relatively intelligent way. I mean, of course, the first question that we might ask is precisely what we mean when we say that a model is integrable. Okay, so this is a very long philosophical discussion. 
But uh, you can say, well, uh, 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 an integrable quantum model is a model uh, that carries conservation laws. If we have a number of non-trivial conservation laws, then we will call the system integrable. Integrable in almost in kind of quantized Liouville sense. So you just have these extra constraints on the dynamics that show up because of the existence of these other conserved charges. However, if you're uh, if you're a bit of an obnoxious, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, just like uh, annoying people with a crazy question, you say, well, you know, uh, that's a stupid definition because uh, then every single quantum model that I can write down, if I can regularize it in some way, that is, if I can take its Hilbert space and make it finite dimensional, then essentially I can, of course, construct um, conserved charges. I can simply Diagonalize my uh, my Hamiltonian. It's a finite dimensional permission matrix. Therefore, by the spectral theorem, it is diagonalizable. I can construct its eigenstates, and then I can construct projectors onto its eigenstates. These projectors all commute with each other. They all commute with the Hamiltonian. Therefore, they're conserved charges. There are dim Hilbert space of them. Therefore, it's integrable. Okay, so so that's uh, that's the statement. Every single Every regularizable quantum theory, no matter what it is, can be considered to be integrable. Okay, but then you say, well, this is completely stupid, isn't it? Because it gets us absolutely nowhere. So then, what is uh, 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 what do we mean? Well, the statement that we can make is that all regularizable quantum models are integrable, but some are more integrable than others. Okay. On the other extreme, if I take a free theory, then it's obviously integrable because I can just uh, separate out my Hilbert space into uh, individual modes of particles that I either occupy or not, and then that's it. The conserved charges will be just the occupation numbers of these momentum modes, and I'm done. But of course, that somehow doesn't capture everything, right? Like XXX, we know is integrable in a sense, uh, while Let's call it exactly solvable. We can write its wave functions exactly. We know that the sets of internal momenta are conserved under time evolution. So essentially, you've got factorized scattering and say that. But anyway, so, so it's kind of difficult to, uh, uh, to give a proper useful definition for this. But anyway, let's, let's just see a little bit how uh, we would go about if we were to construct models whose exact solutions we could write down and we, that we could call integrable in the sense that they have many of these uh, conserved charges. And then we'll see how these conserved charges start looking at what differentiates what we call something integrable and something that is not. Okay, so, um, so, so let's, just, uh, uh, let's just think about it, about this. So the, um, so the algebraic beta ansatz. So um, uh, the idea that we'll pursue is to uh, construct uh, sets of commuting charges out of thin air. Okay, so what we seek is essentially is a set Q alpha of quantum operators that are manifestly different from each other, maybe we'll later write them in terms of spin operators and things, but they all commute with each other. Okay, so such that Q alpha Q beta is equal to zero as quantum operators. Okay, so if we uh, tried to, uh, to just you know, start writing products of Pauli matrices and things like that and just make them commute, we'd uh, get into a bit of a mess. So what we try to do is maybe be a little bit smarter and write a generating function for all these conserved charges. So a smarter way is essentially to construct a generating function which in the notes is in equation 11.1. Uh, so we will introduce some, some extra parameter that will be handy. And we say, okay, we can do this however way we want. So let me just write some kind of form that is 
reminding us of generating functions that we might write for other things. Okay, so I've got some numerical coefficients. Let me write them i n by the by n factorial. And then I have some uh, q n here, which is going to be some, some matrix, some one of these charges here. And then I have this spectral parameter, maybe with some shift here that I want. And then this is to the power n. Okay, so the point is that this is now an operator in Hilbert space cross the real line, or just actually so some complex number lambda that I just use as a convenient uh, construction here. Now the statement that all charges commute here means that essentially this object, which will eventually be called the transfer matrix, commutes at different values of the spectral parameter. Okay, so if comes to construct such a transfer matrix. Okay? My very simple until now. Okay? Now, um, you see, this is a simple commutator. commutator. So I have, I have tau lambda tau of mu. Can I ask a question? Yes, of course. <coughs> Is it, does it matter if there's an infinite amount of these conserved charges or not? Because you wrote in the previous, the sum was infinite. Yeah, it doesn't really matter. Because in a sense, what I will uh, like to do here is do this construction even for a finite dimensional Hilbert space. And then what's going to happen really is that at some point, if I have a finite dimensional Hilbert space, there's going to be cyclicity, if you want. There's going to be a modulo of, in operator space where the higher charges become expressible in the free algebra of the sublying charges. So if you want, when I write this, uh, this infinity here, I could say dim Hilbert space, for example. And then the higher ones would be like that. So, you know, don't worry too much about it. Okay? You'll see, you'll see how the construction works. It's relatively straightforward. Okay? So, now, I think the, uh, the central idea here is to look at this very, very simple relationship here between in principle, very complicated operators in Hilbert space, and simplify your life by introducing a slight complication. And this complication is the so-called auxiliary space. So in the literature of the algebraic beta ansatz, it's always a bit mysterious where this auxiliary space comes from and why you need it, but here it'll be quite transparent. Okay, so what we, what we do is that we, um, we introduce an extra Space, which is called the auxiliary space. Okay, in the notes I kind of call it this curly A. And we write the transfer matrix tau of lambda as the trace of another operator, the trace in auxiliary space of an other operator T of lambda, which I'll call the monotony matrix. Okay? So now, so this relationship here is just equating some operators in Hilbert cross one complex to the same. But now I can essentially rewrite the same relationship here uh, in the tensor product of two auxiliary spaces with Hilbert. So essentially, if I look at this, at this commutator here, there would be this one, which would be a trace in auxiliary space of one monogamy matrix. There would be this one, which would be the trace in another. So essentially, what I can rewrite this equation as is as a trace over A1 cross A2 of the commutator of T in the first auxiliary space with the second. So you see the idea. 
So the idea is that we extend our space by the introduction of this tensor of two auxiliaries, and now the simple statement is that the notion of commuting transfer matrices is very easily realized in this extended space, provided there is a similarity transformation relating the product of two monogamy matrices okay, in two different orders. Okay? Because the, uh, the trace essentially allows us to reorder things, we can immediately write that this is going to be zero, provided there is a similarity transformation between T1 times T2 and T2 times T1. Okay? So, okay, if there exists some object, which I will call R12 of lambda mu, such that R12 lambda mu, T1 of lambda, T2 of mu, with, you know, the inverse R minus 1, but let me just write it immediately in the more convenient and more known way. T1 of lambda, R12 of lambda mu. Okay, so R is an invertible matrix which essentially intertwines these two monogamy matrices. Okay? So now, if I find a realization of this equation, I can go back down the steps of my original construction and construct sets of conserved charges, one of which would be chosen to be your Hamilton. Okay? Um, so there are some, some, some details about this. You know, this is just uh, uh, one way of seeing how it goes. So essentially, there's an important compatibility condition if you, if you consider the tensor product of three auxiliary spaces and with three monogamy matrices, then the R matrices here have to obey the equation that is, many of you will, will have known. Okay, so just by uh, compatibility, you get this relationship here, which is just the Young Baxter relation. Okay, so now again, we're doing things completely in the air. So the statement is that if you can find a realization of this relationship here, then you can go back to the, the one above. If you can then find the monogamy matrix, then you can construct a transfer matrix. Therefore, you have a whole family of commuting conserved charges. Okay? And here we haven't specified anything. I haven't told you what the Hilbert space is. I haven't told you what the auxiliary space is. So you can just freely construct these things from scratch. Okay? You, you, you got to follow what I'm saying? Okay. So let's just do that. What I want to do now in the uh, last few minutes is at each step of the way, I will make the simplest non-trivial choice for all of these things, and you'll see where that's going to lead us. Okay, so let's start with the auxiliary space. Of course, I could say, uh, let me just consider the space of complex numbers. Uh, so then auxiliary space is one-dimensional. Then this uh, R matrix, the R matrix, just by looking at this, it, the, the R matrix acts in the tensor product of two auxiliaries. Okay? So if I just choose some one-dimensional spaces here, this is automatically satisfied. I don't have anything interesting. So in order to get something non-trivial but interesting, I have to choose at least a two-dimensional space for my auxiliary space. So let me do that. Okay? So auxiliary is 2 by 2. Our matrices are now 4 by 4 matrices. Okay? 
And now let me write a generic 4x4 matrix, like in equation 11.16 of the notes. Okay? I have my 16 matrix entries, and these matrix entries are functions of the two spectral parameters, a lambda and mu. Now I have to find a non-trivial matrix that fulfills this young baxter relationship. Of course, in general, it's a bit, uh, uh, it's a bit nasty, so these 4x4 matrices, too many parameters, so then let me make the simplest choice of a non-trivial matrix, which is equation 11, 22. So simplest non-trivial structure. A is like C2. R only one pair of off-diagonal terms. Okay, so R is, again, the, the scale of R doesn't matter, so I can certainly put always one element to one if I so wish. And now I will just put zeros everywhere. except in the central positions where I'm going to introduce some flexibility here. So I'm going to have B of lambda mu here, C function, C function, B function here. Okay, so that's a structure for my R matrix. And now I go back to my young baxter relationship and I see whether I can find some non-trivial realizations of these functions here. Now these functions I don't want to take as just constants because that means essentially that I'll end up with a non-dynamical theory where scattering things don't depend on momentum. I don't want that. So essentially the, the simplest cases that you can uh, think of, well, we'll just detail later. Okay? Now the um, monogamy matrix Okay, so T of lambda, it lives in the tensor product of auxiliary cross Hilbert. Okay, so I can write it explicitly in auxiliary space as a 2x2 two two matrix of Hilbert space matrices. Okay, traditionally, this is written as A of lambda, B of lambda, C of lambda, and D of lambda. Okay, where these are now Hilbert space operators. Okay? Given the R matrix structure that we have here, we have already written the fundamental RTT is TTR relationship, so I can write this out explicitly as a 16 by 16 matrix. Okay? That gives me commutation relations. So RTT is equal to TTR leads to commutation relations between ABCD. Okay, and C, just equation, which is uh, it's not 16 by 16, but it's 16 different, uh, different commutation relations. So C equations uh, 1130 to uh, 1143. Okay? So once again, so we are writing now very non-trivial commutation relations between quantum operators that we haven't even defined. Okay? So we're just imposing structures that we don't have uh, realizations for yet. Okay? So these are the uh, these, these 16 commutation relations which are you know, not the usual Lie algebraic forms, it's like a quadratic algebra. Okay? It's a quadratic algebra of operators that is associated to the structure of the R matrix that we have plucked from here. Have a question? How much would it differ if you were to choose another off diagonal one for the C's than the one you have chosen? So the, the classification of equivalences between R matrices yeah. is something that is slightly beyond me. I don't understand fully what's happening. The thing I can say is that we haven't even classified the possible R matrices. Nobody knows how to classify the full set of them. You can show very
trivial relationships between simple structures, but uh, uh, but you know to have the full catalog of relationships between them, I don't know. So the whole theory of quantum groups in the first place was invented to generate quantum R matrices uh, in this way. But it doesn't mean that you found everything. Okay, so we get our, uh, uh, we get our, uh, our relationships. So we have also that the transfer matrix which just a trace over auxiliary space of the monodromy matrix, but this is just A plus D. Okay, so already we have an interpretation of our A plus D operators. Okay, so A plus D just gives you the transfer matrix of the, of the theory, so the generator of all the conserved charges in your theory. Okay? Now, um, you, can, uh, you can then uh, essentially solve the theory immediately without even having written down what the theory is okay? by making a couple of assumptions. So let us assume the existence of a reference state which will denote like this such that A and D are diagonal lines, such that A of lambda acting on the reference state is some scalar function A of lambda, this, and the same holds true for D of lambda. Here the functions A of lambda and D of lambda are chosen at will, so you can view them as you know, inputs, you put what you want in there, and the structure will still hold. Okay? Now the um, uh, the transfer the uh, transfer matrix itself is diagonalized by by the state of course just trivially from this with eigenvalue little a plus little d. Okay. Now what you can ask is what is the significance of these operators here b and c? Well, actually, what we'll do is that we will assume that the state zero, so the reference state, is annihilated. by D, uh, sorry, by C. So C of lambda on the reference state is equal to zero, okay? If you want this reference state, it's the highest weight vector of whatever it is that this operator uh, raises, okay? Now, what you, can, what you have is that in this case, you will interpret this operator here, P, as a kind of uh, well, you know, I call it a raising operator. It's it's uh, uh, it's an operator that will add some particle to your state. Okay, so eigenstates of the transfer matrix tau of lambda they are obtained from starting from the reference state and acting a certain number of times with this operator here, B. Okay? The construction of this goes as follows. So, so let's, let's just, uh, you know, baptize this, this, the state lambda J here. Okay? So, you can already <coughs> see how A, B, C, D commute with each other from the whole list of commutation relations that you have here. So now if you want to have the transfer matrix diagonalizing this, or you know, being diagonalized by this state, you just calculate explicitly the action of A of lambda plus D of lambda onto this state. Okay? You got the commutation relations, it's just a question of working through them. Okay? So essentially, it becomes an eigenstate of tau of lambda provided 
that some equations are fulfilled. Okay? And this is equation 11.50 in the notes. Provided that A of lambda j divided by D of lambda j times the product over all L different than j of the B function of lambda j lambda L divided by the B function of lambda L lambda j is equal to 1. Okay? You haven't told me what the A function is. You haven't told me what the D function is. I haven't told you what the B function is, but provided it's so chosen so that the young baxter relation is fulfilled, then I can construct a transfer matrix whose eigenstates, or you know, I can manifestly provide states that diagonalize this transfer matrix according to this construction. Okay? And you recognize the shape of the equations is dangerously similar to beta equations. Essentially, that's what happens. Okay, so, so that's just the kind of algebraic structure that you have available here. So the, uh, one of the comments that I want to make is that we haven't specified anything yet. Right? Okay? We, we haven't even specified the Hilbert space we're working in. However, we have already exactly diagonalized something. Okay, so let's just take a couple of minutes to go further. Do I have like four minutes? Or something? Three. Fourteen for three. Yeah, okay, just change one. Okay. So, um, so. Strictly speaking, you have, you, have, you have already found some eigenstates of something. Strictly speaking, I have not addressed any question of completeness uh, of any form whatsoever. I have just managed to write uh, down some formal states that uh, diagonalize some formal operator that I have uh, you know, not specified yet. But let's just be specific now. Okay? So let me, let me actually make the simplest choices that I can make. Okay? So, so finding an explicit R matrix of the simplest form. So simplest, not trivial. Simplest R matrix. Okay? It's the, the one that we had. 1, B, C, C, D, 1. Okay? And now I want some functions B and C that are not constants, but that are as trivial as possible, that have simple asymptotes. So let me just choose B as a function with a simple pole somewhere in the complex plane. Okay? If you look at the young baxter relation, that means that C has to have the same pole, essentially. It's just a question of working through the algebra, and you see this. So a very simple R matrix is this one where, you know, just by convention, I will take B of lambda to be you know, lambda over lambda plus eta, and eta is some, some complex number, some complex number, okay? And C of lambda is just uh, this eta divided by lambda plus eta. Okay? That is a completely legitimate solution to the young baxter relation. I get this. Okay? Now, um, I want to, so I have the R matrix that fulfills young baxter Now what I want to find is a monodromy matrix. But then I go back to my earlier relationship. Uh, here, RTT is TTR, but I, I already have RRR is RRR. So then I say, oh, I want to simplify my life, I'll just say that T is like R. And then this equation here is the same as this one. So this is the way you construct what, is, what are known as fundamental spin models. When, you're, when you hear the expressions fundamental spin models, it just means that you take the, um, uh, the monodromy matrix to be a product of matrices that are isomorphic, or that are just isomorphic to your R matrix itself. Okay, so this is done in section uh, 11.3 for you. If you have the time, I'll just uh, run you through the, the logic because you can, you can look at it. Okay, so that's the idea. You write, you, you've chosen the auxiliary space to be two-dimensional. And then what you'll say is that you've got the solution to the young baxter relation, or the simplest solution, like this. And now you're going to simplify your life. You're going to say, actually, the relationship RTT is TTR. I will interpret, again, using T to be related to my R. So essentially, each um, uh, auxiliary space is a two-dimensional space. So for your T, what you can do is write your T as a tensor product of two-dimensional 
matrices. So on site, there will be a two-dimensional Hilbert space, like spin half. And you'll tensor n of them, and then the product of all these things will give you an operator, which will be your monotony matrix. Okay? And it will be intertwined by this R matrix. And now what you do is that you just explicitly work through the algebra and take appropriate choices of the parameters, okay? And you will see, I mean, my, my time is up, but I invite you to read the notes um, around, yeah, so, so section 11.3 essentially constructs for you an explicit monodromy operator in the simplest possible way, and then with this monodromy operator, you can construct the transfer matrix. Out of this transfer matrix, you can Go back to the very first equation that we wrote down. The transfer matrix is the generator of commuting quantum objects. And then you see that actually when you choose your parameters right, you derive a matrix you know, which is just the XXX Hamiltonian. Okay? That's the magic. So I, I mean I, I wish I had the time to, to do this for you explicitly. But I invite you to just work your way through section 11.3 because this is really plucking the XXX Hamiltonian out of thin air, making at each step the simplest non-trivial choice. Okay? But it's very informative of how you should think about these exactly solvable models, what kind of structures are necessary to uh, be able to write down a beta ansatz like this. Okay? Maybe I need to let you digest this. Uh, and then next time I will just show you why this is such a powerful way of thinking about this. Okay, and then uh, I'll give you some applications of this. Okay?